I'm, I'm sure that uh, there, there are still people coming because of uh, uh, the, the weather problems outside, but um, I think we should sit down and get started, uh, please, um, uh, because uh, the uh, speaker's time is short and I want to take maximum advantage of him. Um, Thank everyone for coming. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Byler Bayoff and I are old friends from Caspian days. I, don't, I won't say how long ago it was, but it was uh, uh, quite a, a long time ago. And uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Washington and to CSIS. It's, uh, generally, we meet in Baku and, and, and points east but uh, not here in Washington. Um, it's, uh, for those of us who've been following the, the Caspian story uh, for, since the 1990s, uh, tremendous progress have been made uh, in the oil and gas sector, certainly in Azerbaijan, and, and Sokar has played a, a leading uh, role in that. Uh, we will uh, be talking about a recent announcement that was made in December of the next major step uh, in the development of, of Caspian, uh, of the Caspian, particularly for gas and, and volumes of gas that will be going to markets a little bit farther than, than uh, where it has reached uh, in the past. Uh, this announcement was uh, long in the making, and I must say long anticipated. Uh, Vitaly played a key role uh, in putting the project together and nurturing it to the point where it is today. So it's a real pleasure to welcome you, Vitaly, uh, to CSIS, when we are eager to hear uh, the perspective from Baku uh, on the announcements uh, uh, of December, as well as uh, more recent developments in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, all very much uh, for the great opportunity to be again here, uh, again with CSIS, uh, which I value very high as an organization with extremely deep knowledge and understanding of the processes taking place. Hello. Uh, taking place uh, in, the, uh, in the Caspian region, in the Caucasus, and in the other regions of the world. Uh, it is uh, honestly a pleasure also to see many, uh, many faces which I know very well and with whom we basically started working together. Uh, and among those, to see Mr. Ambassador Kozlarić yourself. Uh, I very well remember time when we uh, were discussing how to make uh, new pipelines a reality, how to, what we can do all together in order to achieve that goal. Today we're basically uh, there to a very big extent with our Azerbaijan oil developments. Yes, we have pipeline which connects us with the Mediterranean Sea. And I'm proud, really and honestly proud, with the fact that I was part of that effort. I was part of the uh, state oil company, my country's effort uh, to conclude the contract which people now call the contract of the century, but for the sake of clarification, we are now calling it contract of the 20th century because we have now contract of the 21st one, as at least that's what we believe it will prove to be. And we're doing everything we can in order really to make this not really second, 37th, if you wish, contract which Azerbaijan has uh, in the area of oil and gas developments, the contract of the 21st century. I'm talking about gas developments. I'm talking about uh, contract for Charles Denis. And in fact, when I'm talking, uh, before I will start the presentation, when I'm talking about contract for Charles Denis, we're talking about chain of the contracts. Uh, people trying to impress each other all the time with the sizes, with the distances, with the dimensions. So the, well, that's how BP was trying to impress me when they were talking about uh, uh, in the uh, contract from the past, Bakut Bilisi Jihan uh, contract was 24,000 pages, they were saying. 24,000 pages of different contracts, when you put them together, it was only BTC, without any ACG. Different countries, different uh, regulatory frameworks, all of that has been put together. So for the Shah Deniz, we have another impressive figure, and this is four meters high. So four <laughs> meters high is, uh, is what we have in terms of the contracts signed for the only second stage 
of the Charles Denis field development. A lot of paperwork, a lot of legal work, huge amount of the legal fees paid to everywhere in this world. Uh, and we uh, have the result which should prove uh, to be really a contract of the 21st century. But let's go a bit further to what we have. Uh, how we are moving uh, here? Just, uh, just I'm doing down. that, yeah? yeah? Okay. Okay. So 17th, okay, I'm sure we are on the same page. Uh, thank you. Uh, 17th, 17th of December uh, 2013, uh, results uh, of, for me at least, uh, five years of very active work uh, in preparing this four meters uh, of different uh, contracts and pages together with uh, colleagues from Chardonnay's Consortium, led uh, by BP and Soccer, uh, extensive negotiations with the different government, with the different uh, owners of the territories, with those who was interested in purchasing our gas. All of that resulted in so-called final investment decision for the second stage of development of uh, Chardonnay's field. Yes, it was inaugurated in Baku, it was inaugurated in the ceremony which has been attended by many. They were presidents and prime ministers, they were ministers and foreign ministers uh, sitting in the same hall. Uh, they, were, uh, commis they were European Commissar for Energy, Günther Oettinger, there, and all of them were praising efforts made with all these years. And I should uh, state immediately that this achievement, which was really an achievement, achievement to spend money, achievement to build something uh, which we all were trying to establish as our strategic uh, goal for many years, five at least uh, for me, as I mentioned, uh, much longer for the others. This was achievement of many. This was achievement of a lot of countries who were interested in supporting that effort. It was achievement of a lot of companies who were spending their money, their time, their expertise on this. And in the first place, I should obviously mention the support we were always enjoying, we were always have, having uh, from the United States of America and from the European Union. That was a constant dialogue which our country had, which our state or company had, which our partners had with the institutions in all, all these countries and in the United States and in the European Union. That was continuous support of the European Union, and in particular of Günther Oettinger and his cabinet, which allowed us to overcome all these difficulties, to choose uh, between number of choices. And uh, all of those choices, if we're talking about pipelines, for example, uh, they were never easy choices. We were choosing first between ITGI, uh, Nabucco, and Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, then we were left with uh, primarily Nabucco and Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, but there was also option of using the existing infrastructure of the Southern Europe, uh, which we studied very carefully. So never those choices were easy. They were not easy commercially, they were not easy technically. But at the end of the day, Results of these choices, results of these selections, results of the negotiations with the buyers, and intensive negotiations within the partnership itself uh, led us to this fit decision, uh, which was so successfully celebrated and uh, covered and delivered to the rest of the world as something which starts uh, happening from Azerbaijan uh, across the countries which are neighboring with Azerbaijan to uh, Europe, crossing Greece, crossing Albania, reaching Italy, hopefully in the, in the future going further. That what is our decision. So here it's time to mention that uh, what we have is project of obviously international scale. Seven countries are involved into the implementation of uh, this project directly. Direct uh, involvement uh, of seven uh, different countries, but six different regulatory systems. And that's again, it's not at all easy to uh, build the project which should satisfy all requirements, whether of technical nature or environmental nature, which will be cooperating successfully with so different approaches which people may have in Georgia, in Turkey, in European Union, and in, in the other countries, including obviously Azerbaijan. So uh, that's uh, something which we are honestly uh, proud of and uh, we believe that this uh, will be a project which will provide tremendous opportunity for many, many companies, a, a lot of people, a lot of contractors, 
uh, who are involved, who will be involved, including obviously opportunities for the United States companies, including opportunities for the European companies. We are taking care of our own companies, local companies in Azerbaijan, outside of Azerbaijan, participating in engineering, participating in construction of this project. So that's what we are, more or less. So uh, just a bit of data of the field. Uh, 1.2 trillion uh, cubic meters of natural uh, gas, uh, that what we see Chardonnay as being as of today, as standing as of today. Just to remind you, uh, when we signed ACG contract, there were obviously estimates of what ACG in terms of oil is containing. But there were also ideas or, uh, if you wish, dreams about what it might contain. So what we have at the moment is almost double size in the ACG, is almost double size of what we were planning to see in the ACG in the past. So we are uh, well over uh, one trillion barrels in, in the ACG, and that is obviously, as I said, at least twice more than we were projecting for that field at that moment. So what we have at the moment is 1.2 trillion uh, cubic meters of natural gas. What does this say? to me and to the others. Again, when we are talking about estimates which companies and our esteemed partners, and I'm pointing uh, on you just without any idea, our esteemed partners had uh, in their mind before, it was never more than one trillion cubic meters. It was much less. It was seven, 800, cautiously companies were saying. So today, uh, BP, and the rest of the partnership, a partnership consists of seven companies, including obviously us, state owned company of Azerbaijan, quotes a figure of 1.2. And 1.2 is what we are planning to get from the stage one and stage two of, the, of this particular field. But expectations are going further than this. Expectations are higher, and I will touch upon that uh, today. Together with, obviously, gas, we have condensate there. This is uh, one of the biggest in the world gas and gas condensate fields overall. And this is definitely, at least for now, the biggest offshore gas and gas condensate development in the world. It's huge. I, I told you about meters. So to impress, uh, the size of the field is the size of Manhattan. So that's probably another something which we're trying to impress people with. We were always saying that ACG is like, like size of London, so now we are comparing <laughs> this field with Manhattan. <laughs> uh, currently, this field produces 55,000 barrels of condensate. Our plan is to produce 120 at least. And again, this is based on the current vision of the field having 1.2 trillion cubic meters of gas. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot uh, for the, let's say, middle size uh, field, uh, and that, but that makes also important contribution into the Chardonnay's field overall economy. Condensate is an important part of this development. Condensate is what is transported through bakut bilisi jehan pipeline, and if and when necessary, we can use other infrastructure for the transportation of this condensate. What we contracted uh, already within this uh, is 10 million cubic meters of gas, a bit more, in fact, a bit more than that, to be more precise, 10.9 uh, uh, um, billion cubic meters of gas will go to Europe, out of which 10 is contracted and uh, close to one BCM is kind of additional what we can supply uh, to the European customers. And six, and again, a bit more than six, uh, to Turkey at the moment. Uh, just not to make any mistake, this is all and always in addition to what we have from the stage one of this field development. So at the peak, at least as we see it, at the peak of the production of uh, this field from two stages, one and two, uh, only it will be at the level of 23, 20, 24 billion cubic meters of gas, and the same will go for condensate. So the numbers from 55 will increase to uh, 120. Uh, can this be expanded further? And that's also important uh, to keep in mind. It can. It more than can, it will. Uh, it will, and uh, this was a subject of the conversations which I mentioned to you. We had conversations also 
and actually not only conversations, it was very tough negotiations within the partnership. So what, with the partnership, we, what we were discussing uh, with group of partners led by BP was how to develop this field further to maximize the effectiveness of this development, to maximize the extraction of the resources which field has, to reach the levels which are usually acknowledged, recognized in the oil and gas industry. And target is obviously to be somewhere between 60 and 70% of the gas recovery and with the much higher numbers for the oil recovery, condensate recovery. Uh, but also, we were discussing with our partners potential for involving the further structures, both laying higher and lower than the horizons, uh, which we included into the development of stage two of this field. We call it stage three. Stage three of the development of the Shah Denis field is now something which we have already as a project, as a project which we are jointly developing. That project will require additional technologies. That project is something which will be dealing with extremely high reservoir pressures. So something which we never tried, uh, we oil industry experts and specialists, mm -hmm. excluding myself because I'm not a technician, uh, uh, which we never tried in the oil and gas industry, we are applying to, uh, planning to apply uh, in Azerbaijan and to develop the relevant technologies. Among those technologies will be subsea compression, which will allow us to increase the level of the gas ratio, gas extraction ratio significantly to the numbers which I indicated. That's again something which should come. That's again something which our know, design uh, institutions and the uh, best design companies all over the world are working at the moment. The, some of these technologies are at the moment tried in uh, the northern, uh, in the North Sea. Some will be first, uh, uh, first time applied in Azerbaijan. But this is the core of the development of this field to apply new technologies and to develop the new structures. Structures were uh, identified in the course of the development of uh, reservoir within stage one and stage two. So we're now talking about additional reserves in the range of at least uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 trillion cubic meters. So overall, uh, we can expect that this field will be producing, and again, when I'm quoting this, I'm quoting not only myself, but consortium. And I'm using what we expect, we might get, we forecast, we, uh, and, but that is, with, I would say, at least from the state of company point of view, with very high level of awareness. We believe that this will take place. At least 1.4, 1.5 trillion cubic meters of gas, what we expect to get from this field in the course of its f future stages of the development. This gas is not yet produced. This gas is not at all contracted. This gas, uh, obviously, is something which we are having in mind when we were designing the capacity of our pipelines and considering what uh, we can do in the future. Those pipelines which I mentioned, uh, they uh, they shown uh, on this map, and they constitute what we call a thousand gas corridor. Thousand gas corridor is a development which star star originates in Azerbaijan and is planned to be connected with Italian SNAM project, uh, system, system of the uh, main gas transportation uh, distribution system in Italy uh, by 2019. By 2018, we expect these fields uh, to uh, pro start producing and then obviously to deliver to the customers all uh, uh, along the whole uh, route of the S thousand gas corridor, starting from Georgia, obviously part of the gas will be consumed in Azerbaijan, but then will come Georgia, Turkey with this uh, 6 BCM, which I already mentioned. And then comes uh, the territory of the Southern Europe with a bunch of uh, customers, with a bunch of buyers with whom we have contracts. We signed contract currently with 11 companies. Uh, most of them are very well-known names, uh, major uh, oil and gas companies who are very active in the area of uh, the gas uh, industry. Uh, and also, we intend to develop uh, this thousand gas corridor further. And I will again come back to that, but I, I'm just asking you to remember this map uh, and to remember that there, are, there is a possibility to build connectors from uh, this uh, particular network, which does not yet exist. So what you see on the uh, on the map is existing only on the territories of Azerbaijan, Georgia, and partially Turkey. 
So the, the system needs to be built. But when it will be built, there will be additional opportunity to connect it uh, with the neighboring countries, with the further network of the pipelines. And among those, we are mentioning Ionic Adriatic pipeline. Among those, we have in mind the pipelines crossing the territory of Bulgaria and going further, if you wish, repeating the uh, idea of Nabucco route. When it can be done, uh, it will be obviously dictated by uh, the market. It will be dictated by the fact of uh, ex uh, need in our and others uh, gas resources, i.e. in the appetite, i.e. in the demand of those markets. But we again uh, can talk about that a bit further. So, um, I mentioned already uh, that 2018 is our plan to start with the first deliveries of gas to our customers. This is important. Uh, this is important for Georgia. This is important for Turkey that we will be in time with our gas. From one hand side, uh, Georgia uh, is major consumer of Azerbaijan gas. Close to 90% of the Georgian supply uh, comes from Azerbaijan in terms of natural gas. Obviously, there are other supplies which we are providing to Georgia. It is oil products. Uh, and that's uh, cooperation which uh, has very wide grounds, I would say. Uh, so for Georgia, the supply of gas in Azerbaijan is important. Georgia is an important customer. Uh, but Georgia for us is also an important transit country. So both because Georgia gets uh, the transit fee uh, in kind, in gas. So this gas, which will be coming across the territory of Georgia, which will stay there, which we believe will be needed for the Georgian uh, internal consumption, and we have certain forecasts and consideration, will be playing, still playing for many years to come, will be playing an important role in uh, the sufficient, uh, let's say, provision of the energy security of Georgia. Turkey, 6 uh, billion cubic meters of additional gas to be supplied to Turkey from the same Shah Deniz field, the same source is again an important element in Turkey, uh, Turkish energy balance. The country is planning the consumption of gas, uh, relying on these supplies from Shah Deniz, timely supplies from Shah Deniz, and obviously we will do everything we can, everything we uh, are able to do in order to achieve this together with our partners in time. In order to achieve it in time, we obviously, among other things, we need to expand the capacity of the existing pipeline, um, South Caucasus pipeline, uh, from the current uh, 9 uh, billion cubic meters. Uh, in fact, we are using less of that capacity to the future, uh, allowing us gradual increase to the level which I mentioned to you already as gas available from Chardinier's field for export from the stages one and two altogether. So that's what we are planning to do, and for that uh, uh, we will need to not that expansion will meet the usage will need the usage of existing pipeline plus laying a parallel to it in most of the cases and adding compressor stations to the existing uh, system. Uh, the expansion of the existing system through the looping and through the additional compression. This will altogether allow us to deliver at peak existing capacity, I mentioned it, and uh, 23, let's say, uh, uh, of, from Charles Denis, altogether making uh, the capacity of the SCP system close to 30 plus uh, billion cubic meters of gas, which will reach uh, Turkey, where we will see TANAP uh, being pipeline of, uh, at most uh, of the Turkish territory, uh, 56 inch diameter, and then uh, making it 48 inch diameter after Eskishahir, after the point where Turkey will get most of the gas they purchased already, or they are planning to purchase in the future, let's say, uh, for their domestic consumption, for their domestic use. Then we are continuing with the 48 uh, inch pipeline to the border with Greece, where the pipeline, uh, the Bertanap Trans Anatolian pipeline, will be connected with the Trans-Adriatic pipeline, having a similar capacity allowing us to deliver at least 10 billion uh, cubic meters of, uh, of gas to the European customers, both those being those in Greece, Bulgaria, or uh, Italy itself. The point here is also that uh, not only um, TAP can be connected to the TANAP pipeline, but also Greek-owned uh, system of the pipelines uh, operated by the company named DESFA, and DESFA system could be also connected and will be connected to TAP, 
could be connected also to the uh, trans Anatolian pipeline, thus making uh, or establishing a possibility for delivering more volumes into the territory of Greece, more volumes into the, the territory of Bulgaria, which is connected with Greece through the existing infrastructure, but also plans to have a new one, so-called IGB interconnector, it, uh, uh, interconnector Greece-Bulgaria, is again something which we planning to use for the delivery of our gas to Bulgaria. So there are plans uh, with this regard as well, and we will be following them uh, quite strongly. Uh, largest and most complex project in the world, yes. Uh, seven uh, wells already drilled uh, within the framework uh, uh, of the stage two, but total uh, of the stage two uh, wells which will be drilled from the two uh, platforms, uh, we are planning to have uh, 26, obviously, seven plus this 19. Um, Commercial components of the corridor, sorry, I'm kind of running ahead of my own slides, but uh, I already covered the expansion of the existing pipelines, TANAP across Turkey, TAP across these countries to Italy, where it should be connected, and uh, infrastructure to Bulgaria. Uh, the latter is important. The latter is important because it does not yet exist, except for the infrastructure which currently uh, exists, but supplies gas, let's say, from the territory of Bulgaria into the territory of Greece. Will this infrastructure be, be available or not? We don't know. That's why we are relying more on the establishment of the new interconnector, IGB, Greece and Bulgaria interconnector, which could be a project where we will obviously participate as a, a company which is interested in having uh, capacity. We are not among the shareholders of that project. Uh, yet, uh, but uh, we will see, the future will show if there will be interest to our participation, we can consider it. Uh, but the most important is that physical connection, allowing transportation of gas from uh, the Southern Gas Corridor to the territory of Bulgaria should be established. Uh, and we obviously, uh, as I mentioned, uh, are very interested in that. This is uh, properly reflected in this four meters high uh, stack of documents which we uh, prepare it and it, it has its own shelf in that stack. Uh, so this all should be in place. I will not spend too much time on this. This is uh, shareholding of this uh, different elements of the Southern Gas Corridor. This is mainly uh, at the moment consisting of 11 companies uh, working uh, along the value chain. And I should probably mention that Sokar obviously has a serious role uh, in all elements of that chain, starting, of course, from uh, the upstream project and uh, going as far as Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, where we, together with uh, two other partners who are also parties to the upstream development, having 20% uh, of, uh, of TAP. That is important. That is important because all the, uh, all the way uh, there were people were trying kind of to establish a conundrum. Producers versus transporters, uh, wh who should dominate, how should dominate. I don't know who and how should dominate. I know that commercial balance should be found and we believe that we got this commercial balance in this development where we have uh, primarily those who is interested in the development of the resources because those people are most interested in the successful implementation of the project. These are companies present in all elements of the value chain who will uh, spend, who already committed to spend overall uh, more than $45 billion, uh, which is huge even for Azerbaijan with its increased economy and uh, quite high GDP. That's a huge amount of money. Uh, for soccer, it's a huge amount of money which we will be spending on uh, upstream development, expansion of the pipeline, construction of completely new uh, single line crossing the whole territory of Turkey, almost 2,000 2, kilometers across the territory of Turkey. And then Trans-Adriatic Pipeline with its own complexities, going through Natura areas, uh, go, uh, going uh, uh, along the seabed, so reaching Italy in also a region which has uh, environmental sensitivities. So all this uh, is altogether huge commitment, and this commitment is made by producers 
who, as we believe, are extremely interested in developing it properly. But also, uh, not only producers, we have Botash Pipeline Company, who is a shareholder in uh, Trans Anatolian Pipeline in TANAP. We have interest of that company to uh, participate in the upstream development of Shark Denise itself. So we have an interested tendency here, which we never could register before that a company which is traditionally is transport, transport, uh, in charge of transportation is also interested now, and I can state that as this is kind of new fact, it's interested in participation in the upstream development itself. It makes a lot of sense uh, from our point of view, from uh, Turkey point of view, uh, and we fully share this interest if, uh, if there will be commercial uh, agreement achieved with this regard with those who is owning percentages in the upstream, we will just welcome that. Then we have buyers. Uh, our buyers are present among those who are uh, shareholders uh, of the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline. That's again important development. Um, let's try to move uh, this further. And let's try uh, to dwell on why this uh, project, why this corridor, uh, is important for the others, for those who is planning to consume this gas, and uh, obviously to us as well, from our, from our point of view. Uh, security of supply is something which has been debated in many forums for, uh, for many years. And it's quite clear that security of supply uh, is possible uh, to reach only in combination between demand and uh, uh, interest uh, to supply i.e. price, uh, should, there should be certain price balance uh, between those who consumes and those who produce, is producing. Uh, there was a big gap, as we believe, in uh, this balance. This uh, gap was primarily because of the fact that uh, number of suppliers was limited, and those suppliers were, were trying to use their dominating position in the market. Uh, not to say that we are not interested in the high prices as well, but obviously when we are competing, when you are competing uh, with someone, you're trying to do something in order to achieve, uh, to improve your own situation in the market, to get certain niche, you are usually uh, showing a very good level, very good sense of realism. And that's what we are showing. And uh, it, it will not be a secret that contracts which we have signed, they are mutually beneficial for both, for us and for our buyers. And if they are beneficial for our buyers, then you can judge that buyers are getting something more from us than they could get from the others. And because our buyers, uh, obviously, are not driven by uh, the state interest. Our buyers are mostly private companies, and those are driven by their commercial interest. So that commercial balance which exists reflects, obviously, uh, what we were able to achieve with them. But as we understand it, as, as people are uh, evaluating this, it's incre it significantly increases uh, the security of supply uh, by the, for, for the different reasons. Then comes another issue. Uh, what kind of energy we are supplying? What we are, what we are supplying is it making the environmental uh, aspects of uh, economics, economies in those countries better or worse? And here comes, obviously, uh, competition with the coal, which is cheaper fuel for many, but obviously, environmentally, it's not so friendly as gas is. At least that's how we, we see it. Uh, we are providing uh, Europe with uh, the energy which is for sure greener than the energy uh, which Europe is using at the moment. Uh, price issue and uh, North American supplies shale gas supplies. It's, uh, it's important. It's taken into account by us uh, in our projections, in our views. We see that these supplies will be growing. We, uh, that's, that's certainly true. We see that this, those supplies will be seriously affecting uh, the price of gas uh, for uh, the buyers. Uh, through the more, much more liquid gas markets than, uh, than before, Obviously, these supplies will be affecting the prices of our contracts also, and that's all true. But at the same time, it's absolutely, absolutely normal that the gas, which is cheaper, is consumed and uh, is affecting uh, the prices of the others who are supplying those markets. So for us, this is fine. 
This is taken into account in our projections. This is taken into account in the final investment decision made in the 17th of December. But I will disclose to you something which we didn't speak much before. Uh, Azerbaijan is also a, the country which has a lot of shale gas resources. And absolutely untapped. Uh, not given to anyone. There is no company working on this, but there are many companies already showing great interest in the development of our shale resources. One should tell that they, they keep in mind that we are a very small country. Territorially, we are extremely small. And our uh, territories, uh, we, we have uh, nine climatic zones. Those climatic zones, some of them are mountainous areas, some are continental areas. Uh, they, uh, we have tropics and subtropics even uh, within such a small country. Our environment is extremely fragile. So when making decision whether to develop this or not, whether to uh, give to someone license or start this ourselves as state or company only, we will be taking all this into account. I don't expect that these resources will be developed in the near future in Azerbaijan because we have a lot of gas which uh, pro we are producing from the different fields. Uh, uh, in the country which we are pr uh, producing already or planning to involve into the production. But there is shale gas in Azerbaijan and it will be also, I am sure, developed at certain point in the future. And that's important. Uh, another element, uh, we are planning additional gas to Europe. We're planning this additional gas to Europe at the time when the European economy is not on its peak. But we are thinking about the economy, economic recovery in Europe. We are thinking about the period of time between, let's say, 2020 and onwards, uh, when the European economy will be growing and will be growing rapidly and will need much more gas than we or others are supplying to Europe currently. Uh, so that's our, if you wish, vision with this regard. And uh, I can continue with the rest. We are in new volumes in Europe, that's obvious, uh, those uh, Caspian uh, region, Caspian Sea, Azerbaijani gas, practically never was in Europe before. Yes, uh, in fact, we were in Europe. We were supplying uh, into the territory of Greece through, uh, the, uh, through the supplies across the territory of Turkey. Botash was buying our gas and reselling our gas uh, to, uh, to DEPA, uh, the, uh, the major gas buyer in Greece. So by, by, this, uh, by this we were there, but uh, now we will be there for the first time in the other countries and in the same Greece directly, directly as suppliers, supplier uh, from Azerbaijan. Um, we are not large. We are not large in terms of our supplies, that's true. And we will not be large. We will not be large taking the, the size of the European consumption. We, we do not think that there will be a point in time when we will be significantly over 10% of the overall consumption of gas uh, in the European Union or in the European countries. But still, for us, it's a huge development. For us, it's very big. For us, it's almost everything which we will be producing and then uh, leaving, obviously, for our own consumption. The rest will be exported to those who is leading, uh, who is needed in that. Uh, single source, not single source. Well, we are happy not to be single source. We are happy to uh, compete with the others, whether those are suppliers from, uh, from, traditionally, from traditional suppliers like Gazprom or uh, from, uh, from Africa. But to say that we are competing, again, how can a small supplier of something in the range of 10 billion cubic meters to Europe really compete with somebody who is supplying, let's say, 10 times more at least and intends to supply even more? But we will be affecting, obviously, the market and uh, affecting it seriously. The next is uh, the fact of uh, this project, which was supported from many angles and by many, is a catalyst for the other projects. I mentioned already uh, Ionic Adriatic Pipeline on a number of occasions. I mentioned IGB. These are real interconnectors, which we believe will be built uh, because uh, of the ex uh, existence, uh, because of the implementation of this corridor. And this is one uh, which is important. Not talking, but doing. Azerbaijan was always uh, able to justify this, and we hope to be able to justify it again. This is important investment for Greece, and this is important investment uh, in the southern Europe economy. Biggest in Greece, in, in Greece, in fact, at the moment, and will be biggest in the countries like uh, um, like Bosnia-Herzegovina, like Albania, 
uh, for the years to come. That's investment, by the way, which will provide a lot of employment. What we, what we see is more than 1,000 people will be employed overall uh, along the whole value chain, but that's direct employment. But if we will talk about indirect employment, because this project will require a lot of services, a lot of pipe, line pipes should be supplied from the different countries. The whole industry, in fact, should be working in order to supply Chardonnay's and Southern Gas Corridor with the uh, pipes necessary to fill in the 5,000 kilometers from one end to another end of that project. That's huge. So at least 40,000, but multiplying effect would say probably 200,000 people all over the world will be somehow involved into the implementation of this. Gasification, Albania, for example. Albania has no gas consumption whatsoever. Uh, and we do not have, at the moment, plans to start immediately gasification of Albania. But how it can be uh, that pipeline will be crossing the territory of Albania without some gas being used in Albania? We're sure that we will be catalyst for the new power stations in Albania. We will be catalyst for the gas distribution system in Albania. And we will be prepared, obviously, to support that development by ourselves and by the others. And others will come also, because if there is gas, then there is a desire to develop this gas into something which countries can consume. Um, we are first. Uh, we are first stage, uh, as Chardon is, we are first uh, stage in the development of the corridor. But we are not the last at all. So there will be further expansion of uh, our supplies, but there will be further expansion of what we will be doing, and I will come to that in, this, in a second. Uh, I mentioned already that in order to build pipelines, you need to have gas available. Whether we're talking about interconnectors, whether we're talking about thousand gas corridor itself, without Chardonnay, thousand gas corridor will never happen. Without this 20 billion cubic meters of gas available at peak 23, in fact, thousand gas corridor will never happen. But there are other fields and there are other opportunities which needs to be taken into account. And we will keep them in, in, in our uh, account all the time. These are opportunities in Central Asia. And when we are saying Central Asia, this is all traditional what people are discussing all this time. Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, other suppliers. Possible or not? Absolutely possible. Thousand gas corridor, system of pipelines crossing the territory of the Republic of Azerbaijan will be available for those who would like to use them. Yes, it will require additional investment into this pipeline. So they are, at the moment, designed in order to deliver what we have or what we are planning to have, and I will come to that in a second. But they are easily expandable, so they, they could be used. Iraq, Israel, are these uh, uh, additional opportunities? For sure they are. And if you remember the map I was trying to tell you, remember, please keep in mind this map, and 2,000 kilometers of the single brand new pipeline built, which will be built to the highest international standards crossing the territory of Turkey, this pipeline will be available for those who will be prepared to use it for their own gas. Whether this gas is coming from Iraq, whether this gas is coming from Israel, or any other place, we do not have any prejudices to our cooperation. We are cooperating with those who are legally allowed to cooperate with, and we are fully prepared to working within the boundaries of this uh, international agreements, international legislation, our own agreements with those producers or countries uh, the producers are coming from, to develop this corridor to the extent it will turn into the real serious alternative source of supply of gas into the European Union and into the other countries, which are not European Union countries, but countries who are interested in developing those resources. We remember very well that in the past, yes, it was past, there was a lot said about possibility to supply gas uh, from the territory of Syria, across the territory of Turkey, and then further to Europe. If the time will come when it will become possible, we will be prepared to do that. It's not at all reasonable to even to consider that at the moment. But why, why not to think about the future? But um, in doing all of that, we have our strategic goals. I'm almost there. Uh, <laughs> and I think we will have some time for questions after that. Uh, Azerbaijan has its strategic goals, of course. Yes, uh, we could, in theory, we could make more money to selling much bigger than we are planning to sell volumes to the existing customers, to the customers with whom we are neighbors. But we are selling to Europe. We are selling uh, there for a number of reasons. Yes, those are strategic. Yes, those are uh, attempts to 
or desire, belief that we will establish strategic partnership. By the way, our uh, sales contracts are 25 years uh, contracts, most of them. Our European sales contracts are, uh, have a 25 years duration. That's extremely long. That's extremely long, and nobody except for Gazprom probably signed this type of contracts before, 25 years long. But, uh, but of course, they have mechanisms which allow them to satisfy the needs of the suppliers, producers, and the buyers. Overall, within all these 25 years. Uh, our contracts also allow flexibility of moving gas along the value chain. And the more we will be producing, the more will be that flexibility and ability of us who will be uh, regulating the deliveries of the Shanghai gas to the different customers to satisfy all their needs on a daily basis. Uh, because one always needs to remember that when we're talking about big volumes, etc., annual deliveries, in fact, this is not annual, this is seasonal uh, deliveries which are important for the buyers. Buyer in Greece, for example, may have higher demand for gas in this particular day or week uh, for a number of reasons, and who knows what are these reasons. These reasons could be of unexpected nature. Somebody is not supplying. So we will be able to increase our supplies in order to support those who need gas uh, along our value chain at any certain point in time. So flexibility, if the corridor is established, if the corridor is properly uh, coordinated, operated, then you have the operational flexibility which allows you to satisfy your customers in the best available way. That's what we never had in the past when we were supplier to the limited number of customers, so the pipelines with very limited capacity, etc. Um, yes, uh, being connected with Europe through our energy bridges, it's a strategic goal for Azerbaijan, which we hope to be able successfully to implement by 2018-2020. We already have an uh, oil bridge uh, with our uh, customers, worldwide customers, we're crossing the territory of Turkey, and then from the port of Jehan, we're reaching more than 35 different customers, international customers, with regard to our crude oil, and the scale of our crude oil operations is now extremely broad. Uh, we're operating from North America up to Japan. Uh, not the same, but similar and huge scale of the gas development we expect to take place when the contract of the 21st century will be implemented. And uh, SOCAR itself. Uh, Sokar is a state oil company uh, of the Republic. If you wish, it's national uh, oil company of the Republic. What our government wants and what we in Sokar are trying to implement is to make Sokar not only national oil company, but international uh, oil company, international oil and gas company. And for that, we are successfully working in the different areas, uh, regions already. Of course, we are biggest foreign investment in Georgia. That's uh, relatively small, taking the size of the country, but we are biggest there. Biggest investor, biggest taxpayer, biggest supplier, etc. What we are biggest foreign investor in Turkey at the moment. With what we have and what we will have, including Pitkim, Petrochemical Complex and Star Refinery, TANAP, and other projects which we are implementing on the territory of Turkey, we are the biggest foreign investment in, in, in Turkey at the moment. I don't know whether we always will be the biggest foreign investment investor in Turkey, but at least we, we are for now, and that's a very big investment for us. Turkey is an important partner. Turkey is a country with, with which we have very good relationships, special relationships, and those relationships will continue. We are important player now uh, in Greece with the purchase of the majority, 66% of the shares in DESVA, we are uh, turning SOCAR into important player in, in the Greece energy market. Yes, uh, DESFA is transportation operator, but our natural, normal interest is to transport as much as possible through DESFA in order to uh, improve our own return on investment we made into, into DESFA and to develop DESFA further in order to make this system being connected with their neighbors through the same uh, IGB connector or the other future con interconnectors which might be built, the system which will be supplying much more gas than uh, they, it is doing right now. And uh, the last, what we will, we hope, uh, transport through this corridor. It is not only Chardonnay's. It's Chardonnay's one, it's Chardonnay's two, and this is further gas coming from the resources in Azerbaijan. I mentioned already that our pipelines are open for cooperation for others. But 
we, when planning the, or designing the capacity of the system, when talking about ability to increase the capacity of those pipelines easily, when talking about establishment of the pipelines with the big diameters, uh, diameter in Turkey and having two parallel, in fact, two parallel pipelines crossing Azerbaijan and Georgia, we were taking into account the future developments which are available in, in Azerbaijan. Shaldinis II is sanctioned. $45 billion, part of which more than 25 will be spent on the upstream and the reminder on the pipelines uh, is already on the way. Those cash calls are coming on the daily basis. Our companies and soccer are, is paying, are paying them off. But then comes uh, Absheron, then comes ACG Deep Gas, and this we see this ACG Deep Gas as something which is available probably faster than the other developments. Absheron, developed by uh, Total in, uh, in partnership with Gas de France and Socar, is something which we want to see by 2020, 2021. Hopefully, we will. And uh, the further fields uh, of Azerbaijan, they include those fields which are operated by BP and those which will be operated by Sokar. Among them is Umit, which is already field producing with the two uh, working wells. Among those uh, is Shafaga Siman operated by BP. And uh, other fields which we have in mind, Babek is one of those. So each of these fields will contain at least, uh, and uh, I'm I'll probably not say uh, how much it will contain in our, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the significant volumes of gas, which will support uh, the further development of the southern gas corridor into, as I mentioned, serious alternative supply, supplier of gas to the European and non-European economy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Vitaly, <laughs> for, for this very rich presentation on how complex it is, the complexity of the effort involved in putting together a project of the scale, 40 some billion dollars investment in the value chain, uh, and the importance of sequencing of, of uh, uh, the work uh, from wellhead to burner tip. Um, I would next um, ask um, uh, Beth Urbanus from the International Affairs Team at DOE to share uh, the US government perspective on this important project. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Vitaly, for that great presentation. Um, it's going to be hard to top that, so I'll be brief. Um, the, the signing of the final investment decision in December uh, for Sean Denise II and the, and the moving forward of the Southern uh, Corridor projects, um, they mark a culmination of over a decade of intense <coughs> diplomatic and commercial negotiations among many countries, many companies, and many interests. And so the, the fact that, that these are moving forward um, and that these two projects are, are moving beyond the concept stage and into reality um, is significant. And I think we all have to recognize that it has required the companies and governments involved to take very hard decisions to align their interests, to achieve a common vision, uh, to move forward together and to make all of this possible. And so the, the United States very much welcomes uh, this and congratulates uh, the various parties involved, including SOCAR, uh, major player. Uh, on their ability to move these things forward. It's been a long process. The United States government has been a supporter of the process and hope for the realization of these projects for the past 15 years. Um, and so we're very happy to see these things move forward and eager to see them come to fruition. Um, from the U.S. standpoint, I think we look at the, the two projects we're talking about today um, as uh, very important from a couple different perspectives. Obviously, they're important in terms of providing energy security, uh, energy security to Europe uh, and our allies there, that's always important, but also to global markets in general. We see increasing global demand for gas uh, and having uh, projects like this increasing uh, the variety of suppliers in the market is very uh, important, not just for Europe, but also globally uh, as gas market, markets develop and globalize. Um, we also uh, see that this is also uh, significant in terms of aligning the, aligning the interests of the countries in the Caspian with the other countries involved, um, with Turkey, um, with the, the countries that will be involved in the other pipelines in the southern corridor, and so this is also a very important development. And I think the United States also takes the perspective that this project is extremely important for the continued economic development and security of the countries in the Caucasus and the countries along the pipeline, including Turkey and the countries 
countries in Europe. So for all these, uh, from all these perspectives, um, we see this as a globally important project. Um, and we've been very happy uh, to, to be supportive of it. Uh, and we will be happy to see it as it comes to fruition uh, be successful. Um, so I think those are the key uh, viewpoints of the U.S. government. Um, in my shop, obviously, we, we watch things very closely. Um, I think the slideshow has, has explained a lot about the complexity of the project. Um, there have been a lot of moving pieces to watch. There have been the meters upon meters of documentation, <laughs> not all of which I've looked at. Uh, I looked at some of the BTC stuff back in my World Bank days. But um, so, you know, it's not lost on us how difficult it is to get these things done. Um, and so we, we, we understand that. And I think we all realize that we have to work together to make these things possible. Um, and that while at the end of the day, it is a commercial decision um, about how these projects move forward, uh, and that's an important aspect, we also have to understand that it has much broader uh, global economic impacts and to some extent political ones as well. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, I would like next to uh, ask uh, CSIS's own Robin West to uh, maybe broaden the discussion a little bit and talk about uh, what's been going on in the global gas picture. And as he and I know, uh, gas is a very different business from oil, which we have focused our attention on in the Caspian up until recently. Yeah. Um, the gas business is entirely different. Um, as Vitaly knows, it's uh, much more capital intensive. Uh, the oil business, uh, <clears throat> does not require the same kind of infrastructure and there's a lot more flexibility. Um, but the, to me, the, the real challenge is a dog that hasn't barked here this morning, and that's Ukraine. Uh, and um, the fact is that uh, the development of alternative gas sources to Europe has gone up in importance enormously in the last week. And it seems to me that the, this whole southern gas corridor, which has been talked about for years, and Nabucco, and all these different projects, is that this is really the first real step. And Beth is absolutely correct that in the end, governments can huff and puff, but it's going to be companies that are going to, um, A, uh, sign the contracts, which are going to finance the pipelines, which are going to justify the investment. But I guess um, my question to you, Vitaly, is um, uh, as you, you look at, uh, 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 it, well, it seems to me that, that SOCAR has an extraordinary opportunity to be the, the real architects of the gas business going feeding into Europe, um, feeding into countries that are very, very vulnerable uh, to supply from a single market, Russia. Um, and uh, do you see uh, um, uh, sooner rather than later um, uh, this network of, of pipelines and supply that you're building, uh, do you see it playing an important role into Europe? and? You know, is there anything that can be done commercially? Because what governments can do is really pretty limited um, uh, to accelerate this process. Because, I mean, it's become of geopolitical importance. Yes, we do. Uh, and, uh, my answer will be kind of short, but, uh, but very uh, answer oriented. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, but one always needs to realize that ability which Azerbaijan, with its hydrocarbon resources, can provide for the implementation of the Southern Gas Corridor are limited. Uh, the real alternative source of supply could be achieved if there is volumes from Azerbaijan and volumes from the other countries. Only in that particular case, we can go above what I already mentioned as at maximum around 10% of overall European consumption uh, being, we, we being able to supply from one particular field, even if this field is biggest in the world, uh, biggest of shore gas and gas condensate development. I, Azerbaijan and the private investors need to be together in order to develop further the resources existing in Azerbaijan, but also others in the other countries along the route, or even far from the route, but who have an ability to be connected to this route, to this corridor, should be together in developing it further. That will be my answer. Uh, one shouldn't underestimate the, the value of an anchor project uh, uh, in, in establishing uh, su such a corridor. Uh, I would like next to invite you to uh, ask questions. Uh, I will only make two points. Uh, one is uh, Vitaly's time is short, particularly with the number of meetings that had to be rescheduled from yesterday, I'm sure. Uh, so please direct his question, uh, your questions to him. 
Uh, the rest of us may be able to stay a little bit longer. Robin and I are not going anywhere. Uh, and the, the, the second request is uh, uh, please identify yourself uh, as well as um, ask your question or may, uh, your subject in the point uh, in in the in way of a question uh, rather than a comment. Ambassador Kosarich. Uh, for these questions, and uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, I'm with a great pleasure coming back to the memories of the past when we were working together and doing really, really uh, important things. But now we are involved into even more important ones, at least a lot of people say that those are not less important, and I'm again glad. Uh, so the first question of yours uh, was consisting of two parts, who will finance and why, this, why we believe in, in these markets. They are not engines uh, at the moment, but we believe that they will be engines uh, in the near future. When we're talking about Greece or Bulgaria in particular, we believe that these two countries and their need in energy resources will be increasing with the time going. By 2020, as I mentioned, uh, we believe that their energy consumption will be at least uh, from us, the, uh, the volumes of energy which they intend to buy from us will at least double. I will just allow myself to use somebody else's uh, quote for with this regard, and uh, that is not our projection. This is something which Plamen Risharsky, uh, Prime Minister of Bulgaria, recently mentioned that in the long-term run, Bulgaria intends to buy up to 3 BCM, 3 billion cubic meters of gas from Azerbaijan. Yes, this is an intention. At the moment, this gas is not sold to Bulgaria. At the moment, we do not have additional billion cubic meters of gas to sell to Bulgaria within the time frame uh, we are talking about, within the Shah Denis framework. But we believe that in the future, if there will be interest, and Bulgarian government obviously has interest and has certain plans, uh, then it will be done, it will be achievable. As for Greece, uh, they believe there has even much stronger ground. Uh, we believe that Greece will be able to overcome the crisis. We believe that Greece will successfully uh, go through the period when the economy was very low and uh, will go to the spike of their development. And Greece, and in particular uh, us being involved into Greece energy affairs through our now affiliation with DESFA, will greatly benefit from the abilities to consume gas from Azerbaijan. Who will finance? Uh, 
Uh, financing will be, of course, done primarily as uh, using the resources of the shareholders, and including state owned company of Azerbaijan. It was mentioned already at a number of occasions that uh, since state owned company uh, will not be even, on, honestly and sincerely speaking, itself simply to afford such huge volumes uh, of money, which we are, we are talking about here, uh, there will be support from the sovereign oil fund of Azerbaijan, state oil fund of Azerbaijan. There will be support to these particular developments. The rest of the partnership, uh, whether this partnership is upstream partnership or South Caucasus partnership, South Caucasus pipeline partnership, or TANAP, or TAP partnership, they have an obligation, obviously, to finance their shares in the project. But in order to achieve that, there will be combination of external finance and equity finance. And in this particular role, in this particular corridor, Ambassador, again, you're right, the expedient development of the project, uh, particularly of certain elements of it, interdependence of the different elements of the value chain will dictate that uh, equity financing will be a portion of the equity financing will be higher than the external financing. So primarily, this corridor will be uh, financed from the equity of, the, of its shareholders. But of course, there will be external finance as well, and an ex external institution, including expert import agencies. And uh, you can uh, imagine how big is a portion of the supply uh, of the goods, materials, line pipe, etc., coming from the different locations. So Exims will be involved into that closely. And uh, as for the Eastern Partnership, that's obviously not something which I'm uh, kind of following in my agenda. Uh, I'm working for the state of company in primarily in uh, the gas pipelines area at the moment. Before it was different. But I can just repeat what others were saying about us as a country working towards the Eastern Partnership. We uh, hi very highly, uh, in, uh, we, we estimate very highly our existing cooperation with the European Union. I mentioned that in the beginning, including the one within the framework of the Eastern Partnership. And we believe that Azerbaijan will be able to achieve even higher level than level which was suggested within the framework of the partnership. Uh, uh, for the last uh, summit taking place, I believe it's in September, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so our cooperation with the European Union is strategic cooperation, which requires uh, subsequent uh, reflection uh, in the documentation, which could be and will be, we are sure, developed between us and the European Union. And there, is, there are elements of this which are in progress uh, at the moment. Uh, some of them, um, and for me, most of those which I have seen, they have always energy component. But energy is a driver for the further development of the relationships, that's far as I can see it. Uh, we have time for one more question, maybe. Uh, Ariel Cohen from Heritage Foundation. Vitalis. Vitali, it's always terrific to see you, uh, both here and in Baku. Um, you mentioned briefly <clears throat> some of potential Competitors, you know, the 800-pound uh, gorilla that uh, Robin West uh, mentioned. But I wanted you to focus specifically on northern Iraq, eastern Med, um, and North Africa. Uh, I just did a report on uh, Tunisia and Algeria. Um, they have a lot of uh, gas. They have a lot of LNG spare capacity, and they have uh, shale. They really want to emphasize shale uh, moving forward. Uh, to what extent do you see competition? To what extent do you see Eastern Med and North Iraq really getting the critical mass for exporting, which you guys, of course, have already? Well, again, uh, I will not overestimate what we have already. Uh, still, uh, it's a long time to go and uh, a long, uh, strong efforts. Uh, which we need to all to apply along the value chain in order to achieve what I was describing. But I also mentioned that uh, soccer is not afraid of competition. Soccer used to work in the competitive environment. And of course, our partners uh, in the Chardonnay Consortium, they uh, even more used to that and they're working in this environment for the long uh, time. What makes us different from the others that 
also that we are state company. So to a very big extent, we are following the policies which are established or goals, uh, goals, strategic goals, which are established by the state of Azerbaijan. And state of Azerbaijan proclaimed already at a number of occasions that we are fully prepared to cooperate with the other suppliers. Whether those suppliers are from the east or from the west, the only requirement is that this should be legitimate cooperation, which is properly organized in the framework of international legislation, agreements, documents which are signed uh, or we are party to. So with this regard, shale gas, I also mentioned, uh, yes, that's a reality. This reality will take place and the volumes of the gas supplied from the Northern America and from the other regions uh, will be growing. We itself, we, uh, as I also mentioned, considering shale gas as an opportunity which Azerbaijan will be using in our future developments, in the future developments, at the moment we have enough of gas uh, produced with the traditional methods, but there will be uh, others as well. So we are not afraid of competition. More than that, we are prepared to work in the environment uh, which is competitive to all, but also which allows the close cooperation with the others. Because we believe that cooperation and partnerships which we have or which we will have with those companies from Iraq, with those companies uh, from Turkmenistan, will be just healthy competition and healthy cooperation which will allow us to achieve much more. Remember, it's not only upstream which Azerbaijan has. Azerbaijan has interest in the downstream as well, in these pipelines. So if these pipelines will be transporting gas of others, we will be also benefiting that truth of life which is unavoidable. Uh, the fact that we are owners of the big gas resources is not forever, but building relationships and long-term relationships with the others in the region and beyond, we hope will be probably forever at least for the very, very long perspective. And those relationships which should be built with the neighbors at the first place, with all neighbors. We have different neighbors, and their uh, relationships are extremely complicated. But still, we need to maintain the relationships and improve them, improve them with everyone. We need to maintain the relationships with our buyers, customers, with our political friends and uh, not friends. And that's the truth of life. If we will isolate ourselves or our pipelines, then we will not be successful. So the only way to succeed is to develop a cooperation, long-term, mutually beneficial, whether it goes in competition or without competition, but really and honestly transparent and fair. Uh, Vitaly, this is such a rich discussion. Uh, it certainly sounds like you don't plan to live in isolation. Mm -hmm. We would love to keep you and, and welcome you back to CSIS, but your assistants are getting anxious to get you to your next meeting. So please join me in thanking. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, uh, some of us can stay behind. Robin, if you take sure. over for a few minutes. and. Uh, I, uh, uh, the question I'd like to put to some people here is, is really this issue of, uh, this is really the first gas transmission system from this region and uh, going to Europe. And is, is, is this going to be the base load? Uh, is this the beginning? Is this the key element or the, the whole question of other competing projects? Will this impact uh, South Stream and, and some of the other projects? What, what do you think? Put your in in uh, Ukraine, South Stream was a political project of Vladimir Putin. Now it is even more so. And and if you know this project is being built is somehow competing with Russia, certainly in a size sense it isn't. But the markets that he's talking about penetrating, Gazprom already has penetrated and owns assets, companies, pipelines. Um, I, I just don't. Uh, I just don't see that. You don't see what specifically? I don't see this southern corridor as as being a, a game changer in terms of European energy security. It's one element, but not a game changer. Julia, what do you think? Well, I'm going to ask you. I see your point to some degree. I mean, I think that um, Azerbaijan is shipping gas to. Uh, markets where Turkey, I guess, yes, Gazprom has a presence, but um, uh, the Turkish market is growing, so there will be room. Um, Bulgaria, there's an interconnector that needs to be built, so that's still not sure. And Greece, 
small market at this point. I guess it'll grow. The one that you're talking about maybe more mainly is uh, Italy. But I suppose since this goes into southern Italy, there's this issue of maybe gas supplies from North Africa not being as secure, so maybe it can. And we're only talking about 10 BCM. So it's not, compared to what Gazprom ships to Europe and will, you know, in the future ship if things work out for Gazprom, you know, you're talking upwards of 160 BCM. So 10 BCM versus Gazprom's 160, maybe 200 eventually, it's hard to compare. Yeah. Um, I agree on uh, the capacity, of course, but I think something is happening on the map in the last couple of weeks that may um, change the uh, hierarchical order of the suppliers uh, for our European friends and partners. Uh, so that uh, they would de-emphasize one uh, oligopolistic supplier and move to diversify risks. That's why I mentioned North Africa, both piped and LNG. Uh, there is a capacity to push LNG out of Algeria, for example, to UK uh, and other markets, uh, provided the terminals are there. Uh, and uh, if, for example, we speed up uh, building the um, uh, authorization, licensing, and building of East Coast uh, LNG terminals in this country, so that the environment in Europe may become more competitive for gas, LNG, and piped. Uh, shale, I don't want to touch it because other people want to talk, uh, but shale is also something to pay attention to. Thank you. Could you identify yourself? Uh, yes, my name is uh, Anthony Livanios, and uh, I am with uh, Energy Stream GmbH, which is an oil and gas advisory firm based in Frankfurt, Germany. So I would like to say that the Southern Gas Corridor, as it was presented this morning, yes, the 10 BCM is not a large quantity, but the infrastructure is very important. And I would like to take your point that you said gas business is very different than oil business because it's capital intensive. And you need the cost of infrastructure before you actually produce gas. So if for a second we focus on the gas business and we can understand the gas business, in reality, it is not the 10 BCM that are going to be shipped in Europe. In reality, it is the gas infrastructure that is very important. Because once you have this pipeline, which is a 25 billion plus dollars investment, then in the future you can send more gas by expanding this infrastructure or even build up another uh, pipeline that would go to Baumgarten, Austria. So looking at the gas business per se and thinking that in the future you can link also gas supplies from uh, Turkmenistan via Transcaspian pipeline, then this, I know it's very challenging, it's very difficult, and uh, if it took us such a long time to have the Southern Gas Corridor, how long it might take us for a Transcaspian pipeline. But it is there, and there is a commitment from you know, Europeans and the West to actually build and import gas from Turkmenistan. And because it's difficult, I don't think we should give up that. So my point is that this infrastructure is the start to allow the gas business to operate and to diversify from the Caspian region and make European Union less dependent on Russian gas. You know, those of us who look at this from a business end of things uh, believe that the, the structure of the deal is, is really very, very important. Uh, now, BTC was supposed to lead to Kazakh volumes going to the Mediterranean, and that hasn't happened because the structure of the deal was not really attractive for Kazakh uh, producers to move their, their oil uh, through BTC. So in order to establish uh, a, a corridor, which I think Shock Denise too is, is a key project for doing that, uh, you also need a, a structure of the deal that, that allows, particularly for gas, uh, third party access uh, uh, in, in a fair and equitable way that will allow additional volumes to, to, to be uh, attracted uh, if you look at 
Vitaly's last slide of the amount of gas that may be coming out of uh, Azerbaijan, though, you wonder when we will see uh, uh, the uh, Turkmen gas uh, uh, crossing over to Azerbaijan to take advantage of some of, of, of this uh, corridor. That may be the contract of the next century, the 22nd century. <clears throat> One other question I'd like to put to people is, uh, in America, energy security is usually about oil. In Europe, energy security is about gas. Um, energy security is you know, front page above the fold right now, uh, given what hap is happening in Ukraine. Um, and um, uh, I'd be interested, do people feel they're really, will Europeans act as they always have, uh, or will things actually change in Europe this time? And I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, uh, uh, Germany's response was to build Nord Stream, uh, which is hardly a, uh, a diversity of supply. So I, I'd, I'd be curious. Basser, I. Well, one thing, I mean, we all, we all use the shorthand of Europe. There, there are different Europes of from course. a gas point of view, and, and those that are most dependent uh, on, on Russia in particular tend to be in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one issue. And there really are divergent interests from the point of view of... Use the mic. Here. Well, this mic. This, yours is not working. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I mean, there are divergent interests between Germany, France, and... Uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, when it comes comes to these questions, so it's going to be hard to get a a single a single European position. Whether this uh, the events in Ukraine focus the attention, I, I can't say. I'm not smart enough to sure. to know what what's going to be happening in this dynamic situation. Oh, really? But I I would like to just pick up on on Ed's point. I mean, I, I think it's a little premature to talk about Central Asian gas going to Europe because there's no legal agreement over transiting the Caspian with a pipeline. And uh, if Russian behavior in the last two weeks is any indication, uh, I don't believe either they or the Iranians will be very interested in seeing the competition for those supplies going through somebody else's pipeline system. Well, the other thing about what's happened in the last week, it seems to me, is where does that leave South Stream? Uh, on the one hand, you, one could say that South, South Stream becomes an even more important strategic project for, for Russia and Gazprom, uh, given the uh, uncertainty, shall we say, of the relationship with, with, with Ukraine. On the other hand, uh, it may make South Stream a less bankable project than what it already is, which is not a very economically attractive uh, project for anyone to, to in, invest in, and uh, that would have a, a real impact in, in Southeast uh, uh, European gas market over the next five, ten years, it seems to me. Uh, I would like to focus again on the, on the business dimension of the gas. Uh, and you mentioned Iran, which is key. I am very skeptical what will happen with Iran. However, if Iran opens up as a market, and if there are Western companies allowed to invest in Iran, this very existing infrastructure will be a game changer. Because the only country, in reality, that counterbalance Russia on sending gas to Europe is Iran. As we know, Iran is the second largest country in uh, gas-proven reserves. As I said, I'm very skeptical about that, as, I'm, as I agree with you about uh, Central Asian gas. But you see, these are two alternatives. And because in reality, commercial decisions are driving the market and not geopolitical uh, agreements, I think once the market allows for either Iranian gas or Central Asian gas to be shipped in Europe, and we have ready the southern gas corridor infrastructure, this small, but for companies quite large, you know, to actually put $45 billion is a quite large investment. Uh, it's one, it is the largest investment of BP right now in the world. It is the largest gas investment for the European Union. And some of the major European companies, E.ON, which is the largest private gas trading company uh, from Germany in the European Union, is investing, 
uh, and is actually buying uh, a substantial quantity from the South Denise. So the bottom line is that the gas business is being facilitated from this infrastructure. And the opportunities that seem difficult now, which they are, they might allow in the future easier the commerciality of those of you know Central Asian or Iranian gas to be sent to Europe. Uh, the gentleman in the back, uh, Yusuf Babonli, uh, other touch uh, with the uh, heavy investment and expansion that Sokar is uh, going through uh, for contribution into the uh, energy security of Europe. How far do you think Sokar is from becoming another BP? Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, uh, Robin, you may want to comment. It seems to me that Zocar's next step may, may be to be a, 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 another uh, Petronas rather than another BP, a, a, a um, NOC uh, which truly wants to internationalize and be competitive beyond its territory, which uh, there are uh, other examples of, of NOCs uh, that have done that. Robin? I guess that's actually a pretty good answer. Um, but Petronas is a very large organization with uh, enormous resources uh, and um, a highly diversified international portfolio. So this is, you know, this is a, a, a positive first step. But I do think that if SOCAR is the catalyst behind this infrastructure, this initial infrastructure, I agree with you that, that you know, the experience of the gas business is uh, usually um, – Gas demand, in fact, almost always exceeds initial projections. So once gas starts flowing, things start happening. What exactly is going to happen? I don't know. But it, it's terribly important that something be in place to start moving what are potentially very large volumes to this part of the world. Yep. Andy, how long do we have the room for? We're good? All right. Thank you, everyone, for staying. Ariel. What we're looking at is an interplay between the political risk factors and, and geopolitics and uh, the desire of the market to be supplied from various sources at the lowest price. So, for example, given today's political situation between Turkey and Israel, uh, Israeli offshore gas cannot go to Turkey, uh, despite what my friend Matt Breiza published uh, in an op-ed. But I can easily see in five years um, Israel and even maybe uh, Cyprus, maybe, uh, figuring out how to ship their offshore gas uh, through a pipeline to Turkey. Ditto, in a similar way, uh, North Iraqi gas. Today, Baghdad is vehemently opposing the North Iraqi slash Kurdistan gas to go to Turkey uh, through the pipeline. But this is exactly what uh, the colleague said here. The infra once the infrastructure is there, it's kind of like the base baseball field, if you build it, they will come, and the Turkmen gas, if the Chinese will not finish it by the 22nd century, and there's more gas in, in uh, Turkmenistan, may go across the uh, Caspian uh, to the west, if the, if the demand is there, and if European economic growth is reasonable. Now, um, in terms of uh, Gazprom as a competition, yeah, it's, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge, uh, Na uh, national gas company. However, it's uh, locked in uh, a, a serious fight uh, with Rosneft. Rosneft is moving to uh, the LNG sector. It's moving to the shale gas sector. It's more dynamic. Um, and uh, so far, Gazprom did not uh, demonstrate uh, a lot of agility. So I think there is a space with a certain uh, piece of the European market share that other more nimble and agile competitors, including Sokar and others, may move in there and grab some of that market share. Not all of it, but some of it. I think what's interesting, when I was listening to Vitaly and how he described, well, there could be rock, there could be other gas sources that come in. But clearly, you know, it's, it's SOCAR that's controlling this infrastructure. They will own 80% of TANAP or 68%, I guess, as it's spanning out now. But one of the things that um, is clear is that the Azeri Oil Fund is going to be the largest financier of um, this effort. So ultimately, what will be interesting 
is to see in the future as other sources come in, I think the referee will have to be SOCAR because it will have the biggest stake and the biggest financial stake also in terms of the existing infrastructure. So how this develops will be, I think, also dependent on uh, Azerbaijan's uh, desire to work with certain other suppliers or potentially if there's 50 BCM eventually of gas out of Azerbaijan, then I would imagine that's going to occupy most of whatever this expanded pipeline will be. Uh, that's a very important point, Julia. I mean, w w those of us who have been watching this for a while noticed that one of the difference this time around on Shakhtar East 2 and as well as the uh, the uh, downstream pipelines uh, is that SOCAR has really taken a leadership role compared to the BTC days when it was really the oil companies, BP in particular, which uh, uh, Vitaly uh, paid uh, uh, a proper respect to, but, but he understated uh, SOCAR's own role in moving these projects uh, uh, along, determining uh, the size of pipe, uh, uh, what uh, direction uh, the pipeline is going to go. Their investment in DEFSA is, is clearly a, a, a strategic one. So there's a lot, uh, the game is being played a lot differently, not only because it's gas, but also because the, the uh, state company champion uh, is playing a, a, a bigger role than before. Rich? But do the, do the existing agreement allow that to happen in ways that don't back out supplies from the, the shareholders in, in Shakhtanese too? Well, that, that was the problem with BTC. <laughs> uh, and and I, I haven't even seen the four meters of agreements, never mind uh, 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 examine them. But, but I, I, I think this is really important. And, and I think the, the point that uh, Julia made, which is that as Azerbaijan may be over quite a long period of time, transitions from a producing country to a transit country, where transit is its own profit center uh, uh, for, for Azerbaijan, then those commercial agreements will have to be a lot more accommodating than the ones that are by design protective of producer shippers who after all have to guarantee the financing for the current project. So, so th there's a commercial logic behind why those agreements are written the way they are, but that may need to change uh, over time. Uh, I thank all of you very much for your uh, coming out on a snowy day, and, uh, and uh, or at least yesterday was a snowy day, uh, and, 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 and cold day, and, and, and staying behind and, and uh, joining in this robust discussion. Hope to see all of you again soon.